Romans chapter 5. The singing tonight has been a blessing. We appreciate the ministry of, through song in this church and how that it plays a vital part in our services. Romans chapter 5. We're going to read one verse tonight just after we <clears throat> have a word of prayer and try to bring to you the message that we feel that the Lord would have us to. We'll try not to be too long in the message tonight. We have some to baptize at the close of the service, and so I'm going to try to be conscious of that anyway and uh, try not to be too long in preaching. But in Romans chapter number 5, I want to read one verse just after we bow for prayer, and that'll be verse number 12. Father, thank you tonight for the privilege again that we have to open the precious Word of God, a privilege, Lord, that we dare not take for granted. And I thank you, Lord, for this place that you've given us in these past six years as we've stood here from Sunday to Sunday, proclaimed the unsearchable riches of Christ and tried to expound the Word of God. And I want to just say thank you for the many, many blessings that we've enjoyed together in these past six years. I pray tonight as we look into your Word that you'll help us tonight to preach with a fervor and the fervency of the Holy Spirit. And may we speak to hearts that are here in this place tonight to be a means of encouragement and challenge to each and every individual here. And I pray that you'll help us as your servant to be yielded to you and to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit as we preach. And we'll thank you and praise you for all that you do because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In Romans chapter number 5, <clears throat> I want to read one verse of Scripture tonight. Wherefore, as by one man sin <clears throat> entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death was passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12 teaches us about what one man did and the effect that it had upon the entire world. This verse of Scripture relates to each and every one of us. We're all affected by it. One of the things that I possibly would have preached about on last Lord's Day morning included the depravity of man. I believe that this verse teaches the depravity of man. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And I know that the doctrine of the depravity of man is contrary to the humanistic philosophies of our day and what is being preached and taught, especially through the school system on the uh, secular humanism and especially the New Age movement, they want to bypass the doctrine of the depravity of man. But all of us were born with a sinful nature in need of a Savior. And that's what this verse is teaching us. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, one man, Adam, through the whole human race, in sin, depraved and separated from God. I want to take tonight this verse <clears throat> and take a thought from this verse and preach tonight from the principle of this verse, though I'm not going to preach the context of it. I want to preach tonight on what one man can do. What one man can do. And I want to just kind of take you through some familiar ground in the Scripture tonight and remind you of what one man can do. I get to the place sometimes where I think I am just one man. Well, I, I, they just one of me. Sometimes I need more than one of me. Sometimes I need several Berman cakes at the same time. But uh, I don't know how many of you need to hear this sermon tonight, but I think I need to hear this sermon tonight. Amen? I feel like I've been, uh, you know, I'm in a 10-round uh, fight with the devil, and I've lost the first nine rounds. 
But I want him to know tonight there's still the tenth round left and I'm looking for a knockout. Amen? <laughs> Amen. But uh, wherefore, as by one man, what can one man do? Many of you tonight might be sitting there thinking at times when we serve the Lord and we see things <clears throat> in the ministry, well, I'm just one man. What can one person do? Well, from the scripture tonight, I want to just encourage your heart Though you be one individual, there's a lot that one individual can do. Yielded to the hands of the Lord, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. There's not anything God needs to get done that he cannot do through your life if you dare yield yourself to the Lord. Now, I need to be reminded of that from time to time, that, uh, that in the hands of the Lord we can do anything God bids us to do through his power and through his strength. First of all tonight, I want to take us back to the book of Genesis. And in relation to a man by the name of Noah, I want to say that one man can preach the righteousness of God in a society of sin. You, I, I tried to imagine, and if you would try to imagine how it must have been and what it must have been like in Noah's day to have lived in his day. And by the way, you and I ought to be acquainted with what it was like to live in the days of Noah because Jesus said, if you want to know how it's going to be just before I come again, he said, look at the days of Noah. And he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And so we're reliving those days that Noah lived in. We're living in the days of sin and immorality. Noah lived in a day of immorality. He lived in a day when there were sexual abuse, marriage abuse. They were eating and drinking and giving in marriage and so forth. And the Bible said they were so caught up in their sin that they knew not until the day the flood came and took them all away. But the Bible talks about Noah being a preacher of righteousness. That was his reputation. He was known as a preacher of righteousness. And as the scriptures tell us, that when God spared not the angels that sinned, or God spared not the old world, but only Noah, a preacher of righteousness, the Bible calls him. Now, what he simply means by that is this, that Noah was a preacher of right living. He taught, he taught and preached people how to live right in a day when sin was so prevalent and when sin was so dominant in the land. Now, I want to say that it must have gotten awful lonely at times to Noah. There must have been times when Noah felt, what's the use? Nobody's listening to me. Did you know that Noah preached for some 120 years and only had eight converts? And, and those converts were his own family. And I imagine there are times the devil got on Noah's back and said, Noah, you're a fool. You're enemy number one in, uh, uh, all around. People think you're a fool. And I imagine they mocked him and they made fun of him. They rejected the message he preached, but Noah kept on preaching. He was one man. I want to tell you sometimes that if you're a preacher that believes the Bible and, and uh, believes what you preach and, and, uh, and live, try to live what you preach and stand for anything and preach righteousness in our day and preach that people ought to live right, I still believe people ought to live right, don't you? Amen. I believe if you're going to bear the name of Jesus and bear the name of a Christian, you ought to live up to your name. It's unpopular anymore for a preacher to preach on righteous living and on living godly and sold out to the Lord. We're living in a, in a world that is so engulfed and influenced by the pressures of this world. But I want to tell you something. I don't intend to change. I intend to keep on preaching like I started out preaching 24 years ago. Amen? I said it feels that Noah must have felt lonely at times as though he were the only one. And I want to tell you, it gets kind of lonely sometimes and it feels kind of lonely. But I want to tell you, I, regardless of how unpopular that it may become, 
And regardless of whether or not it's received or rejected, it has nothing to do whatsoever with the Word of God. And I believe that God needs some preachers in our day like Noah that in spite of the sin of our society that will still lift up their voice like a trumpet and cry aloud and spare not. I believe this generation still needs to hear some preaching about righteousness and godliness. Regardless, what can one man do? One man can stand up in his day in the midst of a sinful society and preach the righteousness of God. Everybody don't have to go along with it. Everybody does not have to agree. Noah had no one to agree with him. Noah did not have. Sometimes I think, and listen, I don't want you to stop hollering amen. We kind of been on the quiet side. Amen's worth $10 a piece this morning in this place. And they're about worth that much again tonight. I don't want you to stop hollering amen while I preach. It's all right if you holler amen. But I want to tell you, I'm going to preach whether you holler amen or not. Amen. I don't think Noah had a very much, he, he didn't have very much of a, uh, of a cheering section in his day, but he rode back and preached anyway, amen? Now, I, I think it's a lot easier, and I think it's encouraging to a preacher to have a, a cheering section and, and have those that holler amen. But I was thinking about old Noah, you know, I doubt very seriously if Noah ever heard an amen to what he was preaching. But he was just as faithful as he could be, and he preached. You say, well, what did Noah accomplish? He preached for 120 years. He only had eight converts. Well, I want to tell you one of the greatest compliments that that can be paid to anyone is that they win their own family to God. Noah won his family. What can one man do? One man can stand up in the midst of a sinful society and preach the righteousness of God. Something else one man can do is found in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16. One man can proclaim the deity of Christ. You remember when Jesus asked Simon Peter, he said, Simon, whom do men say that I am? And Simon answered him and said, Lord, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say thou art Elijah. Some say that you're Jeremiah. Some say that you're one of the prophets. And Jesus said, but Simon, whom do you say that I am? And Simon said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now I'm going to tell you the move that's on in our day, in this society in which we're living in, even among some theologians, that they're trying to bring Jesus down on a human level and to destroy his deity and make him no more than just a good man and a good teacher and maybe a good prophet. But I want to tell you something tonight, regardless of how unpopular that it may become, I'm going to keep on preaching that Jesus was a son of God. I'm going to keep on preaching that nearly 2,000 years ago that God was incarnate in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and when Jesus came into this world that he in Indeed, was everything that God was. I'm going to keep preaching the deity of Christ. I'm going to keep preaching that, that Jesus and his Father were one. I'm going to keep preaching that Jesus was God himself incarnate in the flesh. By the way, if you read the scripture talking about the birth of Jesus, there's one scripture that God did not leave it up to the modernists and the theologians to interpret. But he said, this is Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave it up to some preacher to interpret what Emmanuel means. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that it means God with us. And Jesus was God with us. He was God in the flesh. One man can proclaim the deity of Christ, and it may get down to one for so where it just where it feels like it just, it's just one anyway. And I don't tell you, Jesus was a, he was the Son of God. One man can proclaim proclaim the deity of Jesus Christ. What can one man do? Another thing one man can do is one man can please the Lord by walking with God. You remember a man by the name of Enoch? Back over in Genesis 5, the Bible said that Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. 
And over in Hebrews 11, the Bible said that Enoch was a man that, that pleased God. And in Hebrews chapter 11, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch was a man that walked with God in his day. Listen, he lived in those days before the flood. He lived in those sin-cursed days that preceded the flood and the judgment of God. But the Bible said that Enoch pleased God in his day. He walked with God in his day. I want to tell you, if the devil tells you that you can't walk with God in the year 1991, he's a liar. The devil's a liar tonight to tell you that you can't walk with God. I want to tell you something tonight, young people that go to school and you're, you're, you're exposed to all the sin and the temptation the devil tells you you can't go to school and live among your peers that does not know God and you live for the Lord and be pleasing to the Lord. But I want to tell you the devil's a liar. You can walk with God and be pleasing to the Lord in the school. If you're the only one, you can do it. Enoch did Every once in a while, somebody say, Preacher, I want you to pray for me to get another job. The job I'm on, I'm the only Christian there, and it's just so hard to live for God. I just can't live for God and work on the job where I work. I want to tell you, you can work in the midst of sin right in the devil's face and please God if you want to. God gave the same grace that Enoch had to walk with God in his day when he was only one among all of the sin and corruption of his day. If, Noah could, if Enoch could walk with God and be pleasing to the Lord in his day, you and I can do the same thing. God don't have to give you a new job. He may give you new grace. Amen. He may give you new grace. God does not have to change one thing in your circumstances for you to be pleasing to the Lord and walk with God. I remember when I worked on the job, when I first started living for the Lord, and I want to tell you, when you live like the devil on the job, and then you get right with God, and you go in and run your flag up, and you, you talk about problems. You have problems. I remember when I worked on the job, and I lived like the devil, and, and I'm ashamed of that, and I'm not bragging or boasting about that. I'm ashamed that, that I ever lived in sin and was displeasing to the Lord. But one day when I got right with God and I went in on a job and run my flag up and took a stand for God, I want to tell you the devil got mad about that. And I remember praying and saying, God, you're going to have to get me out of this place. All this sin, and I remember they made fun of me. And I remember they talked about me. I remember I was in the bathroom one day having a pity party, feeling sorry for myself. They'd been on my case. You know, they called me, they started calling me deacon, and then they started calling me preacher. They finally got it right anyway. I wasn't a preacher at that time, but they started calling me that. And I remember there's one fella on the job, came in the bathroom one day. God sent him in there. He knew what I needed. His name was John Wright. God sent old brother John Wright in the bathroom that day, and and I was in there feeling sorry for myself, just almost in tears. No brother John Wright come in there and got to talking to me. And I fellowship with him for a while. And every once in a while, I'd go by and see him. Every once in a while, he'd come by and see me. I want to tell you, tonight, you walk with God on the job where, I mean, listen, you can live right in the midst of hell on the job where you work and you can still fly your flag high for Jesus. If you want to, you can please the Lord in the midst of it. And somewhere in there, there'll be another one like you. God, I mean, God will send them. He'll send them by. I remember there used to be a fellow named Darrell Cranford. He used to, I used to hide from him. I used to run from him. I knew what he's going to do. He's coming to witness to me. And I'd run. I'd see him coming. I'd hide. I'd, I'd get scared because I knew what he was going to preach to me. I didn't want to be preached to. When you're, when you're out of the will of God and living like the devil, you don't want nobody talking to you just makes you that much more miserable. Oh, listen, I prayed for old brother. After I got right with the Lord, I prayed for God to send old brother Darrell by and let me fellowship with him for five minutes. Amen. I mean, he's one of the, he's one of the sweetest faces that I've seen after I got right with God. There'll be somebody there somewhere 
I mean, listen, they may be scarce as old saying goes. They may be as scarce as hen's teeth, but I want to tell you, there's somebody there that you can find, that you can fellowship with. The devil wants you to believe that, that, that you're just one among all those sinners and you can't live for God and walk with God on the job, but you can. God will give you grace to do that. One man can please the Lord by walking with God. There's something else that one man can do. One man can prove the power of prayer. You remember Elijah? You say, oh, but preacher, that was Elijah. Well, turn over here for a moment in your Bible to the book of James for a moment. Do you know Elijah was a man just like you and I? The Bible says he was. Look in the book of James chapter 5 for a moment. One man can make a difference. There's a lot of things that one man can do. Look in, look in verse number 16. We'll start in verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now listen to verse 17. Elias or Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now, the Bible says, why did it make a statement, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are? Because the Lord knew that somebody was going to read that story over in 1 Kings chapter 18, and they were going to say, well, that was Elijah. So the Lord wants you to know that Elijah was a man just like you. He had the same passions. He contended with the same flesh, but he served the same God, and, and what God could do through one man by the name of Elijah, God can do through you and I. The key to it is the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Do you know tonight there's not anything that prayer cannot do in, in accomplishing your life if you dare live for God? I'm talking about yielded to the Lord, totally yielded to the Lord. One man can prove the power of prayer. It's good to have all your friends pray. It's good to have the entire church pray. Not anything wrong with, with sharing a prayer request as I did a few minutes ago in the service. But one, it, it doesn't take a church full of people to prove the power of prayer. It doesn't take a group of preachers to prove the power of prayer. But one individual can prove the power of prayer. Do you remember when Elijah challenged the false prophets? 850 of them, prophets of the groves and, and the prophets of Baal, he challenged them upon the mountain. He said, it's time for a showdown. He said, it's time for us to see who's really God. If Baal is God, then we'll serve Baal. But if God be God, we'll serve him. And so the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the groves, they built their altars and they called on Baal for a half a day. And they were so serious and sincere about what they were doing that they took stones and cut themselves. And the Bible said that blood gushed from them, that they took stones and cut themselves to prove their sincerity, trying to get Baal's attention. But they prayed and Baal never answered. But Elijah, in the days when it had not rained in the space of three and a half years and water was very scarce, he built the altar, put the bullock upon the altar and told him to take three barrels of water and pour it around, that, around the trenches, around that altar. And he said, do it again and do it again. And he did that four times until 
he had poured 12 barrels of water around that sacrifice. And the Bible said that Elijah got out on his knees and prayed a little prayer with a total of 63 words in it. And the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifices and licked up the water in the trenches. God used one man to prove the power of prayer. You keep reading in chapter 18. There had not been a drop of rain in three and a half years. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. But Elijah said, go tell Ahab that I hear the sound of abundance of rain. And the Bible said he went up on top of Mount Carmel and sat down up there and put his head down between his knees. And he began to pray. And he sent his servant. He said, I want you to go yonder and look. And Elijah prayed. He come back and Elijah said to his servant, he said, what do you see? He said, well, I didn't see anything. Elijah said, well, go again. He said, in fact, I want you to go seven times. And every time that servant went and come back, he didn't see anything. But on the seventh time, and Elijah just kept praying. And on the seventh time, that servant come back. Elijah said, what do you see? He said, I see a little cloud rising up out of the sea about like a man's hand. Elijah said, that's it. That's it. You better tell Ahab to get off this mountain because the rain's coming. And the Bible said that the heavens opened up and God sent the rain. One man can open the heavens. One man can close the heavens. I want to tell you, one man, one woman, one boy, one girl can in this day prove the power of prayer. It just takes one. Sometimes you think, well... Nobody really cares about my burden. Nobody really cares about my need. You ask people to pray, and sometimes you wonder if, they really, if it ever really registered with them. But I say it's good to have a family of God that you can share your burdens and your prayer requests with. But I want to tell you something. You're God's child tonight, and you as one individual can prove the power of prayer. Doesn't make any difference how... Impossible the situation may seem. Listen, it's a pretty big task to tell it not to rain for three and a half years. But that's what Elijah told Ahab. He said, I want to tell you, it's not going to rain until I tell it to. That's pretty bold, isn't it? Amen. That's pretty bold. It's not going to rain until I tell it to. And for three and a half years, it didn't rain. And, the, and we look at those miracles that God just cut off the, the rain for three and a half years. And how that God sent the fire of God down from heaven to consume the sacrifices on top of Mount Carmel. And the Lord said, I don't want anybody to think that that can't happen to them. I don't want, that to, I don't want anybody to think that they can't get anywhere praying. So I want you to just put it down in the book. The Holy Spirit of God moved upon James to write it down and say that Elijah was a man of like passions like you and I. One individual can prove the power of prayer. I'm just one man, preacher. Well, you can still preach righteousness in the midst of a sinful generation. I'm just one man, preacher, but you can still proclaim the deity of Christ. I'm just one man, preacher, but you can still please the Lord by walking with him. I'm just one man, preacher, but you can still prove the power of prayer. There's something else one man did, and it appears as though he was all alone, and that's over in Acts chapter 3. One man can praise the Lord in the sanctuary. Do you know that over in <clears throat> Acts chapter 3, you remember that lame man? He had been lame from his mother's womb, the Bible said. And when this miracle was performed upon him, the Bible said that he was above 40 years old. Now, you think about this. Here was a man that was above 40 years old. He had been lame from his mother's womb. He had never walked. He had never taken the first step in his life. Peter and John came by one day, and he was sitting at the gate called Beautiful, asking alms of those that would enter into the temple. And when Peter and John came by, he asked alms of them and expecting to receive something from them. Peter and John looked upon him and said unto him, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, 
give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Bible said in verse 7, he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Now notice this in verse 8. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which set for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. One man. Somebody said, well, boy, I'd love to get in one of them services where people praise the Lord. Well, why don't you? Amen. All it takes is one. I mean, when we come in sometimes and it, I mean, it seemed like that, that uh, I mean, about the only thing to do is just deliver the eulogy. <laughs> That, we, that that's about all we'd need to have a funeral service. I mean, listen, sometimes, folks, we're dead. Now, we got a reputation of being Baptist-costal around here. That's somewhere across between Pentecostal and Baptist. We got that reputation around here sometimes. I don't apologize for it, and I'm not a bit embarrassed about it. As long as things is done God's way and decency and in order, and as long as God's in it, I don't, even, I don't get embarrassed. Don't bother me a bit. But I mean, sometimes, I mean, when, I mean, when it's that way, wouldn't it be kind of strange if just one, listen, now I don't mean to pick on Sister Bailey, but sometimes she does a solo around here, amen? Sometimes Sister Bailey will, will get in one of them Holy Ghost life and spells back there and shout and she does a solo all by herself and all the rest of you look like you're wondering where God's at. It don't take but one to praise the Lord. This man was the only one in the temple, but he went, the Bible said, he leaping up stood, walked, entered with them in the temple, walking and leaping. He was walking and leaping. He jumping up and down. Praising God in the temple. I'll tell you something else. Here's a man that had never walked. The Bible said he had been lame from his mother's womb. He was above 40 years old, they didn't have to teach him how to walk. He didn't have to learn how to keep his balance. He took off running and walking and leaping. I'll tell you, that's a miracle from God, folks. And I want to tell you, when God does something for you, it's worth praising him about. It's worth getting excited about. I don't think they had to encourage him along to you. I don't think they had to ag him on. I don't read none of that in the Scripture. He didn't have nobody prodding on him and pushing on him. God gets a hold of you just right. It won't bother you at all to run that hand up. <laughs> Praise the Lord, just takes one. One man can praise the Lord. Just takes one. In fact, it's a whole lot easier when everybody else is doing it, isn't it? I mean, if this fellow had walked in the temple and everybody in there had been, been praising God and they'd been up leaping and walking and around in the temple praising God and he'd just joined in with them. But he was the only one. But it didn't hinder him. He just went walking and leaping and praising God through the temple. What can one man do? One man can praise the Lord. When the, when the rest of the world's silent, one man can praise the Lord. Thomas is reading it. Scripture over in Psalms 95. Folks, he's worthy of all of our praise. He's a great God. He's a great God. You're breathing his air tonight as you sit right here in this building. So I don't have, if you're breathing, I read a statistic one time, and this has been years ago. This was before inflation ever hit. I probably, read, I probably read this article. It's probably been 10 or 12 years ago, and you know what the last 10 or 12 years has done to inflation. 
But 10 or 12 years ago, I read an article that talked about if we had to buy the oxygen that God gives us free every day to breathe, that it would cost you $30,000 a year just to breathe. That's been 10 or 12 years ago. Probably cost 100000 now just to breathe. Do you still say you don't have anything to praise God about? You're breathing. Now your arm may be hurting. Your lumbago may be hurting. Your arthritis may be killing you, but if you're here tonight and you're breathing, you've got something to praise God for. You say, preacher, you trying to work something up? You trying to stir somebody up, get them praise the Lord? No, I'm just trying to get you to see that we've got something to praise God for every day that we live. If you get up in the morning, put your feet on the floor, you've got a reason to praise God. It just takes one. It just takes one. And I wonder sometimes if God don't look down upon some of our services sometimes when we're so preoccupied and we're so consumed with the cares of this life and he looks down upon us and he sees us sitting there in the pews and some of us, our mind is a hundred miles down yonder in the South 40 somewhere, not anywhere close to God at all. And if God don't look down over the balcony of heaven on us and say, oh, I wish there'd be just one that prays me today. I wish there'd be just one that'd lift a hand to my name today. Just takes one to praise the Lord. In fact, I said one man can praise the Lord in the temple. One man can praise the Lord anywhere. If it's good at church, it's good at home. I grew up in the home where my mom is an old-fashioned shouting Baptist. I've heard her pray herself happy many a time. Get up off her knees and Shout just as much at home as she does church. Amen. I'm glad I grew up in the home like that. Well, you can praise God anywhere. You can go down the road. It gets kind of dangerous sometimes if you're not really in the spirit. You better make sure God's really. <laughs> You'll end up around a telephone pole or something. But many be the time I've gone down the road just praising God, just me and the Lord in the car, just praising God and having a big time. Well, Brother Ira Bowen told me here a while back, I can't remember what the circumstances were, but I remember him telling me here a while back that he drove somewhere from, from across uh, around 285 or the other side of Atlanta somewhere. I don't even remember going. and said, man, I was having a good time, just me and the Lord. You can praise God anywhere. Amen. One last thing, and I'm going to quit. I forgot what time I started. One, one man, or I might need to say, one woman. I use the term man in general, not just speaking of the male gender. I'm not ready to change to the modern day terminology yet. But one man, one woman can proclaim Jesus to a whole city. Had never taken a course in soul winning. Never been to Bible study. But as somebody said, she met Jesus by the well. She went there with a water pot in her hand and left with a well in her soul. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that just like Jesus? A woman whose reputation was shot who was the talk of the town, went out to draw water one day and met Jesus and left with a well of water springing up in her soul. You know what she did? That one woman didn't have much of a reputation. Everybody knew what she was. She had been under the scorn and reproach of the people that knew her. But that one woman went back to Samaria, went back into the city and told them what Jesus had done for her. And the Bible says, look down in, in uh, verse number 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith unto the men, Come see a man 
which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Now notice verse 30. I'm in John 4. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. She went back to the city saying, come see a man. Oh, nobody wouldn't listen to her. The reputation that she had, nobody would believe her. Nobody would listen to her. But that one woman who carried that well of water, of, of living water, back to the city with her and told them what Jesus had done for her was influential in that city, coming to know Jesus as their Savior. Look at verse 30. He said, Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Look down verse 39. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified and told me all that ever I did. Many of those Samaritans got saved and come to know Jesus because one, one, one man can do a lot of things if we would, yield, if we would realize that yielded to the hands of the Lord that it only takes you and God to be a majority. I was thinking about Lot. You remember when God was going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? And the musicians can be coming, and I'm going to close in just a moment. But, but in Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot, the Bible said, was a just man. The Scripture said he was. You'd never know it from reading about his life. But the Scripture said in the New Testament that Lot was a just man. But when God was going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, if I can find 50 righteous, I will not destroy the city. He started at 50, to make a long story short, he started at 50 and ended up with as few as 10 and said, if I could just find 10 righteous in Sodom, I would not destroy the city. I would show mercy. And he could not find 10. Do you know that if you count the family of Lot that have Lot had of won his family to God, one man could have spared a whole city. One man. If Lot, if Lot had accomplished what Noah did in his day. And by the way, Jesus said, if you want to know how it's going to be before I come, look at the days of Noah. But he also said, if you want to know how it's going to be before I come, look at the days of Lot. Lot and Noah were in similar circumstances. Noah won his family to God and a whole city went up in smoke because Lot, one man, did not win his family to God. In fact, when he tried to warn some of his own family, they laughed at him and said, he seems as one that mocks. They didn't even take him serious. When he told them to get out of the city, God was going to destroy the place. One man, my, my whole emphasis... Now, this message tonight is that one man can make a difference. Will you be that man? Will you be that woman that'll make a difference? Young person, will you be that one that'll make a difference in the school where you go? Will you be that one person who'll make a difference on the job where you work, community where you live? Will you dare yield yourself to God and be that one person that God can accomplish His will through in your life. Well, every head's bowed and every eye closed. Just before I pray, I want to ask you a couple of questions. There might be people here in this building tonight that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You say, Preacher, if I only knew I could live it, I'd love to become a Christian. Well, I want to tell you up front, you can't live it. You cannot live the Christian life on your own. But the Bible said that to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. God will give you the power. That's his responsibility. Your responsibility is to come to him. It's his responsibility to give you the power to live for him. And you can live the Christian life if Jesus is in your heart and you're empowered 
by the Holy Spirit that lives within. You may be here tonight. You say, preacher, if I were to die right where I sit tonight, I have no hope of heaven. But I would love to be remembered in prayer. I wonder tonight if you're here in that condition, you're not saved. Would you just slip up a hand for prayer? Now, I'm not trying to embarrass you or single you out, but I'm going to pray in just a moment, and I'd love to remember you in prayer anywhere in this building. Now, just slip up that hand for prayer and say, Preacher, I'm not saved, but I do want to be remembered in prayer anywhere. I wonder if there might be Christians here tonight say, Preacher, I know without a doubt that I've accepted Jesus as my Savior, but I have lost the truth of what one person can do and I've just taken the attitude, well, I'm just one person. What can I do? And I've allowed the devil just to throw me a curve. And I, my life is not really counting for God. But I want you to pray for me. And I'd dedicate my life to God and I'd make a difference. Whether it be where you go to school, where you work, community where you live, or among your family members, whatever your need is. Would you slip up a hand for prayer and say, Preacher, I want to dedicate myself to God. I want you to remember me in prayer. I want to dedicate myself to God. I want to make a difference. Though I be but one, anywhere in this building, slip up a hand for prayer. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? Father, take the message now and use it to your own honor and to your own glory. And Lord, if just one individual could leave here tonight saying, by the grace of God, I want to make a difference where I go to school, where I work, community where I live. I want to be that one person. Lord, if just one could leave here tonight, then it would be worthwhile. So I pray you'll move on this invitation, help people to respond and be obedient to you as the Holy Spirit leads and directs. And we'll give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.